Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back, the worker, the American worker. For centuries, American or political scientists, politicians, economists, not to mention workers, have been concerned with the state of workers, right? There, there's Marx, there's Trump, there, everyone, right? Um, recently, though, concerns for the American worker seem to be through the roof. Maybe that's just me, um, but I feel like I've been hearing it a lot. Uh, today, on March 31st, 2023, I'm excited to have Scott Lincecombe back on the podcast. Second time. He's the director of General Economics and Trade at the Cato Institute, and recently he co-authored and edited a book called Empowering the American Worker, Market-Based Solutions for Today's Workforce. I'm excited to get into it. Welcome back. No, thanks for having me. Good to be back. I'm, I, I often take credit for launching your your career, um, you know, being one of the original uh, podcast guests, uh, clearly, uh, you know, you can draw a straight line from that to your superstardom. Yeah, totally. No <laughs> multicollinearity there. None. No, no, no. It's correlation is causation. That is the end of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So right. speaking of correlation being causation, what is the most important thing that people my age yeah. or in my generation should know that we don't? Oh, gosh. Uh, wow, you really start with the easy ones, huh? Um, you know, I, I, I think the number one thing, uh, well, I, I would, I'm actually going to pick two things, but they're very closely related. Uh, one is, uh, look, things change in life and you should be, you should embrace that. Right. That, you know, the plan that you have set out for yourself uh, when you're 18, 19, whatever, is uh, not going to be what, how you're going to end up when you're an old man like me in, in his 40s. Um, and uh, that's OK. Right. In fact, it's it's pretty great. And so change is is good and, and you should embrace that. And the related one is you really can't take yourself too seriously. Uh, and that's related in the sense that, you know, everybody has this, uh, especially high, highly motivated uh, college kids have this plan about what they're going to do. And they're very serious about it. And oh, man, life's too short. You know, uh, um, you got to really enjoy the time you have uh, and and Im and be a little silly, you know, um, because uh, the, the 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 things you think are very very important, very serious today, probably aren't, uh, unless you know you're talking about like your kids or something. Uh, and even then, a lot of it is silly too. So uh, have a have a smile about a lot of it because it's probably not going to matter in the way you think in the long run. That is a timely piece of advice, not because I'm thinking about kids, but because I'm in college. And if you're not freaking out about what you should be doing to get from point A to point B, you're freaking out about figuring out what point B is. And, uh, yeah, and, and boy, I mean, look, I, I was a bit of a type A planner when it came to my, my life plan. You know, I, was, I went to Virginia to uh, basically get a GPA because I knew I wanted, I wanted to go to law school, and I did eventually do that. But uh, in between, I ended up at Cato, which I didn't plan at all. And here it is 20 something years later, and I'm back at Cato and never would have in a million years have you have had asked that 18 year old Scott, uh, would you be the director of some muckety muck? think tank in Washington, um, in economics, no less, um, I would have told you, you were, you were, uh, uh, insane. So, um, yeah, a lot changes and it's important to kind of embrace that, you know? Um, and it's funny, that's kind of a theme of, of the book that we're going to talk about in the sense that the best thing you can do is kind of lay a good foundation. Um, keep your avenues open. Don't burn bridges. Be nice. That's the other thing I tell our interns all the time. Uh, don't fall into the, uh, it's cool to dunk on people thing. Uh, there is a huge amount of, uh, it's hugely important to just be a nice person, uh, uh that, that goes a long way in life. 
That's a good point. I try to be nicer every day. Yeah. I think I think I think I'm I'm getting like, better. You at never it. know. I mean, you never know when Yeah, I mean, you never know when uh the person you're talking to might actually be some linchpin in your in your future life plans. You never know. And so um the you know, scoring online points or whatever it is to uh get a little of that sweet, sweet dopamine today uh might cost you big in the long run. Um and so it's always better to kind of maintain a uh a a, a you know, you don't have to be a pushover, but uh, at the same time, um, you know, burning bridges for for uh, cheap points is, is pretty dumb. So moving on to your book, what inspired you to write yes. it and how did that come about? Yeah, so uh, personal reasons and professional reasons. Um, I will start with uh, the professional. The professional is that uh, the book grew out of my personal fr or professional frustration with, with uh, hearing everyone on the right and the left lament the plight of the American worker and put that plight firmly at the feet of the free market, that uh, decades of market fundamentalism have destroyed the American working class. And thus, of course, we need government. We need lots and lots of government. We need wage subsidies and protectionism and uh, mandates restricting uh, independent contracting or mandating certain benefits like paid family leave or whatever. We need all these government actions because the market is really dysfunctional and it's really been, and that, you know, is all this free market libertarian fundamentals, fundamentalism that's caused it. And the reason this was frustrating is because uh, anybody who picks up the book will realize is it's absolute nonsense that, uh, there are all sorts of government policies out there from labor regulation to housing and transportation and child care and occupational licensing and criminal justice and so on and so on and so on. Um, almost any issue where you scratch a problem, you find bad government policy underneath, um, bad non-market government policies. So uh, that frustration then pushes to the second point, which is, well, that means there's a lot of actually market-based, pragmatic reforms that could be implemented to help American workers to, you know, lower the cost of health care or child care or expand uh, job opportunities for people with criminal records or lower housing prices and improve occupational mobility and on and on and on. Right. And uh, these never get discussed when you hear Washington talk about pro worker policy. These policies almost never come up, despite there being a ton of academic consensus on the left and the right, that um, things like occupational licensing and, and uh, land use regulation and zoning and so forth do really bad things for the vast majority of American workers. Same goes with protectionism and tariffs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and despite the fact that a lot of states have been experimenting with these types of market-based reforms and having really good success um, at a very kind of small ball minor league level. Um, and so uh, the book tries to provide that free market case for helping American workers um, and helping American workers, and this gets to the last point of frustration, be the workers that they want to be, not the workers that a bunch of folks in Washington think they should be. Because if you hang out in Washington long enough and you hear people talk about pro-worker policy, when they mean what they talk about the American worker, they tend to be talking about a tiny sliver of the workforce. Uh, you know, uh, middle-aged, mustachioed, um, manufacturing worker, sole breadwinner men, for example. That's apparently, that's, you know, in D.C., that's like half the workforce. And then the other half is like a uh, single or cohabitating urbanite female who is struggling with, with ch uh, high child care costs or, or uh, potentially, right? Those are like the only two uh, workers out there. When in reality, the vast majority of the Amer American workforce is very different very diverse. Workers have all sorts of different uh, goals and hopes and dreams and jobs and, and the rest. Um, and they value things that aren't like mandated 
you know, childcare or uh, family leave or whatever. They uh, really value flexibility and adjust. Um, and they uh, want to go out and better themselves and they find themselves stymied again by all those policies. So the goal of the book is kind of to, to let workers be the workers they want to be. And that is focusing on uh, adjustment and flexibility and dynamism, meaning market churn, people move moving from place to place or job to job to allowing workers to have more control over their own money. Um, and I don't mean just in tax policy. In fact, we barely talk about tax policy. I mean more in terms of things like benefits um, and you know the ability to have a portable set of your own benefits that are your property that you can take with you from place to place or again, job to job. Um, and things that have been shown, these are things that have been shown to boost the very beneficial type of, of uh, economic dynamism that we want in the economy that you know boosts wages, boosts uh, lifetime earnings and just overall happiness and productivity and the rest, right? So, so that's what we set out to do. Um, so that's the professional side. Uh, the per personal is that I personally went through a lot of the problems that the book lays out. Um, I have been an, o an OG remote worker. I've been working remotely from here in North Carolina since 2010. Uh, I moved from DC where I was a lawyer to North Carolina, um, uh, you know, now 13 years ago. And it seemed that every time a problem popped up, there was some dumb government regulation in my way. Uh, I had to join the North Carolina bar, even though I was practicing international trade law for a Washington, D.C. firm was never going to be practicing any type of state law. Uh, I had to, uh, my law firm had to create a Delaware company to pay me because tax law for remote work was so antiquated that every single partner was going to have to fill out a North Carolina tax form because I was theoretically generating profits for the firm in North Carolina. Um, we had problems with home-based business regulations and problems with independent contracting because I do, you know, I write a, write on the side. And case after case after case after case, um, there were these dumb policies uh, and in the way. Some of them were just classic protectionism, right? It was, you know, those North Carolina bar rules protect North Carolina lawyers. So that's just, that's just good old you know, uh, uh, protectionism, but some of it was just because they're really old and antiquated. You know, you look at our rules on remote work, some of our rules on benefits and healthcare, this stuff isn't like intentional government policy. It's just based on a type of workforce that doesn't really exist anymore. So, um, I, you know, I had a kind of a personal grudge against all of this and wanted to, to write about it. Uh, and the last point that I think is really important is that I had a ton of help. So I, I navigated all of these rules and restrictions and all of these costs and the rest, but I did it because I had a massive multinational law firm behind me, you know, paying me well, helping with all these types of forms and licensure and the rest. There are millions of Americans don't have that, right? Who are not as fortunate as I was. Uh, and so it's, it's not just enough to say, oh, well, Scott, you know, you, you got by fine. So it's, what's the problem? The reality is it's a problem for a lot of people and, uh, we need to, we need to make some changes. Wow. That, I mean, makes a lot of sense. You've given us a good summary of how, Washington doesn't necessarily see the worker for who the worker is, who the worker actually is, what these sorts of problems are. Um, so I guess, I don't know, there kind of seems to be an actual plight of the American worker, though, other than just government intervention, government stepping on your toes when you're trying to move. Things like deaths of despair. Um, how does that kind yeah. of relate to the general plight Sure. So there, and that, and that, you know, in the introduction, I get into this a little bit. Um, it's not, and this is, I think, the key. Uh, it is not a general plight. Uh, there is no doubt that certain pockets of the American workforce do face very real issues, um, issues that are not not simply a, a, a directly attributable to government policy, right? 
Um, you know, you mentioned deaths to despair, and look, yeah, you know, um, opioid abuse uh, is a a a problem, and it's a problem particularly for uh, young youngish workers, right? Um, and there are also problems, somewhat related problems, related to very what I mean, very low skill uh, male workers, right? Um, but those are discrete problems for a pretty small share of, of the population. In g- general, the plight of the American worker has been wildly oversold. Um, you know, median worker wages in the United States are are up in inflation-adjusted terms up about 50% since the 1990s. So that means essentially – you get one we the median worker has been getting basically 1% richer every year for the last 40 years give or take um, and you know there are there are ups and downs we're talking general long term trends um workers also are um finding their way in terms of um uh, finding the right balance in a household so the the so called plight of the two earner trap is nonsense. Uh, the reality is that we have about the same amount of two earner couples and, and households today as we did 40 years ago, right? Um, and there's, I think, undoubtedly true that in terms of our personal consumption basket, so just our baseline poverty, what we consume every day, um, Americans today are wildly better off than they were uh, 50 years ago, right? The so-called halcyon days of the of the American worker in the 1970s. So it's very, very important to instead of talking about, again, this general plight, to really focus on where the real problems are. Um, and I think that that because that generates a far, far different policy response than some of the stuff you hear coming out of Washington, again, related to like wage subsidies or protectionism tariffs and the rest, uh, benefit mandates and all that kind of stuff. Uh, none of those things are going to really help the American workers that are struggling. Um, so, so I think that's a, the first really big point. The second one, though, is that is that you can, I think, in a lot of cases, find some government policy problems buried in some of these real worker problems. Um, you know, my Cato colleagues, of course, for years have talked about how, uh, you know, the opioid epidemic is in very large part a product of our idiotic war on drugs. Right. Um, and how uh, the the latest problems um, re- related to drug overdoses and the rest um, are, are, again, very much related to the fact that we've banned all the the, the drugs that are are uh, less uh, toxic and fatal. Right. And so people go looking for a high. They look for a very uh, easy and cheap one and they end up with stuff that that makes them very sick or, or worse. Right. Um, we again, I wrote about in the book on criminal justice policy. You know, um, we have thrown a lot of young men in jail and whether that's correct or incorrect is the reality is that having a criminal record dramatically depresses labor force participation. So if you're worried about kind of young men being somewhat disconnected from the labor force, well, either A, uh, don't criminalize everything, including drugs, but especially a lot of other stuff. But B, um, give people an easy way to get rid of that criminal record after a period of good behavior. And we talk about that in the book related to automatic expungement. Essentially, you get arrested when you're 18 and being an idiot. Uh, 10 years later, that, that arrest record is no longer on your record. It doesn't even exist, right? So you're not burdened by that. That's a problem, not just for young men, by the way, it actually burdens a lot of women, perhaps even more uh, because of social stigmas attached. So, uh, you know, and I can go through millions of other examples. Welfare policy keeps people trapped in bad neighborhoods. Uh, housing policy makes it impossible for people to move out of those bad ma- neighborhoods and into high growth cities because we've jacked up the price of housing, right? So you go on and on and on. And I think you can still, even for those discrete problems, you can find a lot of market-based solutions. And before we kind of 
go further into where government intervention has gone too far and caused problems and all of that, I want to explore the China shock. Uh, A lot of politicians, a lot of people point to China's entry into the WTO, the World Trade Organization, as a starting point or a factor in the decline of workers. Um, That The trade competition with China has displaced over 2 million workers between something like 1999 and 2011. I don't know why that's the, yeah. the, the time range, but what is your take on this China shock? I got to start by saying um, for anybody listening, I actually wrote a very long paper on the China shock a couple of years ago. Uh, so if you really want to get into the weeds of all of this, I highly recommend that. But I'll give you the very short Cliff's Notes. Although, do you, do you guys even still have Cliff's Notes? Um, but anyway. Um, yeah, we do. Here's the here's the okay well here's the TLDR as the kids say version of <laughs> of this. Um, yes, uh, it is undoubtedly true that Chinese imports into the United States have increased and increased rather rapidly during that period that you talked about about 1999 to 2011, give or take, right? Um, and it is probably true that that new import competition displaced some. U.S. workers and and destroyed some U.S. jobs. So there's the truth of the China shock. But here's the 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 rest of the story. First is that two million number is really misleading in a couple of ways. Um, first is mm-hmm. it doesn't consider at all the jobs gained by trade with with China. Um, when you account for those jobs and when you account for the economy-wide benefits using, you know, like a general equilibrium approach, um, you actually turn out with – you actually see far fewer jobs actually displaced and in an economy-wide overall job growth and economic growth. So – the job story is one that 2 million number is a classic case of just looking at the costs and not considering everything else, right? A very static, myopic model, kind of a micro model, ignoring the macro stuff, okay? The second problem, though, is that 2 million number, while it sounds big, is actually not very big when you stretch it out over the whole China shock period. Uh, you're talking about fewer than 200,000 jobs per year, only half of which are in manufacturing. The rest are in services that, you know, in the local town where the manufacturing plant was. You have to then compare that to how many jobs the United States economy, which is massive, sheds or destroys every month. And that's millions of jobs. We just happen to gain millions of others. So you're really talking about a tiny fraction of overall job churn. You're also talking about a tiny fraction of overall manufacturing job losses since, say, the 1970s or 80s, right? Because the United States has been steadily losing manufacturing jobs um, for decades. And that is related to trade, that's related to automation, it's related to changing consumer tastes, meaning we buy more services today than we buy manufacturers because, you know, nobody needs seven washing machines. Um, And once you get one washing machine, you go and get a massage instead or whatever. So um, that it's just not that big of an issue overall. And so when you start blaming the China shock for all of these problems with, uh, say, young, uh, less educated males in the Rust Belt, um, you're really overgeneralizing. Um, and, and that's a big problem when it comes to finding policy solutions, right? Because cutting off all trade isn't going to solve any of these problems. And that's particularly the case when you look at places that were similarly hit by the China shock say, textile country in South Carolina or furniture country here in North Carolina, well, all of those places have rebounded and are now thriving. And while it's only a few places in the Rust Belt where everybody, you know, in Ohio or wherever, where all the video cam, where all the TV cameras are and New York Times reporters are interviewing, you know, Trump voters, um, we all focus on those places that are still struggling. We ignore the 
far more places that have simply adapted, adjusted, and moved on and are doing other things today. So that again tells us that the problem really, and this is, if you listen to the China shock authors themselves, they'll say this, the problem really wasn't trade with China, better for good or bad. The problem was simply that certain areas Areas didn't adjust while other areas did. And once you realize that the China shock is an adjustment story and not a trade story, well, that again argues for a far different approach to policy solutions. And that, again, I think my, my book um, is has a ton of policy solutions when it comes to helping people adjust more quickly, whether it's um, you know having more savings through uh, universal tax-free savings accounts, or whether it's to um, have uh, a, a different or better education. Um, and you know, again, you can go down the list. We mentioned housing and transportation, all this other stuff, right? So there's a ton of ways that policy can make it easier for workers to get on with their lives uh, and to adjust. And that's where we should be focusing, even again, if you take the China shock stuff as gospel. So when you say adjustment, it makes me think of the Econ 101 barriers to entry, because what stops you from adjusting? Oh, there's a barrier to entry. It's like, yeah, if you don't, identify and remove the barriers, the the clog in the pipe, then if you put another solution in place, like government intervention, a jobs program, or putting more money into it, whatever, you're just putting stuff into a pipe that's clogged without unclogging the pipe. Right. Uh, do you think politicians or people who advocate for more government see it that way or even see that this could potentially be part of the problem? Uh, probably not. Um, you know, I, I think politicians are very transactional and they, they want to win votes. They want to get reelected, right? Classic public choice stuff. And so they don't really ever think about the second step in the, you know, they don't think about the, and what happens next, right? To quote Thomas Sowell, right? It's, um, it's only about alleviating the immediate pain that might be felt by someone who very, you know, legitimately is worried about losing a job or did lose a job. And that stuff is, is painful. There's no doubt. So the politician just simply looks at, well, I'm the one to fix it. I can fix it. Government can fix it. And I'm going to fix it. I can't fix it by saying, we're just going to eliminate some government barriers here and there, and then the market's going to work itself out. You're, you're, gonna, you're not going to win elections doing that. You have to promise some sort of concrete policy uh, solution, and that's going to be more money or a new program or whatever. Very rarely is it going to be almost anything uh, discussed in my book, as much as I wish it were, right? I mean, I think those are real solutions, but they're not political solutions, or at least not politically palatable ones. So, um, you know, maybe if you get talk to some of the wonkier politicians out there, some of them get uh, what's going on. But for a lot of them, it's just simply, you know, about winning votes. And the way you win votes is by promising people stuff. Imagine if I could promise you more money, more jobs, and more freedom. What do you say? All I have to do is actually deregulate and not promise you anything new. Yeah, I don't see that flying. <laughs> oh. Right. And and it's very counterintuitive, right? You know, that's the other thing. When you tell people that, for example, I mean, the labor regulation chapter in this book is one of my favorites written by Ryan Bourne, uh, and, and he and I collaborated a lot on it. And if you try to tell people that labor protections under the law are actually making you poorer, they're actually lowering your lifetime earnings, making you and the economy less productive. And that's the research shocking. I'm not saying that. You can look at a place like Europe that has more of these labor quote unquote protections, right? Where it's harder to get fired. It's harder to change jobs. All this stuff, this is, you know, you know a good old protection um, for workers. Well, it turns out that they have more on employment. They have more partial employment and again, lower, uh, lower living standards. It, that is a very hard thing to sell. Whereas a guy like Joe Biden shows up and says, I'm going to protect this. I'm going to give you that. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, let's face it, that's just a, a much easier sell. Well, so speaking of that part of the book, what are some 
prime examples of that regulation and how exactly do they hurt workers unintentionally? Yeah, well, um, so I think a a very easy one is um, like minimum wage laws, right? So minimum wage laws make very obvious sense. Uh, People aren't getting paid a lot. And so the government's going to essentially force employers to pay them more. Well, the problem, of course, is that uh, that is going to reduce demand for that labor, right? Because if if a worker isn't actually generating, uh, you know, a value for a, a company or an employer, the employer's not going to hire them. So there's a lot of literature that says that when a minimum wage laws actually decrease employment um, for low wage workers, particularly like teenagers or very low skill workers. But even if that doesn't happen, there's tons of other literature that says that workers uh, lose out in other ways. Maybe they they work fewer hours. Uh, Maybe they don't get fringe benefits. Um, Maybe they have to work harder. Their boss is breathing down their neck all the time, so they actually generate enough enough profit and value for the firm, right? And on and on. And so minimum wage laws that, that on their face seem like they really help can actually end up hurting. Um, and And you can really go through a lot of different proposed labor regulations that do just this. You know, uh, California has this AB5 on independent contracting. And the theory is that a bunch of employers are getting away with not offering mandated benefits fits by designating the workers as independent contractors. So we're just going to ban that, right? Um, And we're only going to let a very few number of of people, workers, be independent contractors. Well, it turns out um, that's just, that narrative is just not true. And it turned, and and the the law that California passed caused a a lot of people like freelance writers, in other words, just uh, other folks, to be suddenly out of work. And it's even spurred protests by like uh, owner operator truckers because they liked what they, their, that model, they liked being independent and suddenly their business model was, was mandated out of existence. And so you can go through the list, predictive scheduling laws and all sorts of others where again, the, the, the intent is probably good, but the result is pretty bad. And the independent workers, that's kind of like the Uber thing, right? Is that the same thing? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. In, it's Uber. So, yeah, the idea is that uh, gig workers are basically um, underpaid uh, and and abused um, by being independent contractors. And the polling doesn't really show that. It shows that, first of all, uh, most independent contractors love being independent. They don't want want to have a boss. They like being able to, you know, pick their own clients and their own hours and the rest. But also, especially for gig workers, um, which isn't a big share of all independent work, by the way, it's like less than 10% of all independent workers. But gig workers actually, uh, not only do they value the independence, but they tend to be um, doing this as a part-time thing, right? It's like a side hustle. They, they're, you know, artists or I- I doing something else with their lives and they're just drunk driving Ubers uh, to, you know, help pay the bills. And so if if you were to ban that practice, you wouldn't be suddenly having a fleet of 40-hour-a-week, fully staffed out, you know, with great benefits Uber drivers. You just would have no Uber drivers, right? And you'd be back to kind of the old taxi cab model, which sucked, by the way. Uh, you, you kids probably don't don't even remember that period, but you couldn't get a cab to save your life. And when you did, uh, there was a, a decent chance that person was actually going to screw you. Uh, so it's very, the, the advent of Uber and Lyft and the rest has been and pretty awesome in that regard. So even, but even leaving aside all those great consumer benefits, um, a lot of workers like them too. And the governments want to legislate them out of existence. And, you know, like I said, some of that is well-intentioned, but a lot of it, again, is just protectionism. You know, labor unions don't like gig work. They don't like independent work. They want everybody to be, you know, a unionized uh, wage slave because that's better for membership and political power and the rest. And so, you know, uh, a lot of the attacks on independent contracting are really attempts to boost unionization. And I mean, this might be very silly and might date me in not the way that most people intend when they say that, but I can't imagine like 
how on earth did the taxi system function? If you want it to come to your house, what do you, what, <laughs> you call them? And then what, you can't track them? So you don't know yes, when they're going to show that's up? that's exactly, no, here's what you, so here's what you did. Uh, the night before, let's say you need to go to the airport at eight in the morning, right? The night before you called a cab company and you said, I need a taxi cab at my house tomorrow morning. And they said, okay, we have you down. And then you basically hoped and prayed that the cab showed up. And if the cab didn't show up, you were screwed. You were basically going to hop in your car and try to hoof it to the airport uh, in time to make your flight, right? So uh, that's, and by the way, uh, that is the thing that people don't get about the old system. It wasn't merely about a cab versus an Uber. It was oftentimes about nothing versus an Uber. You know, studies show, for example, that Uber drivers are willing to go to neighborhoods that cabs wouldn't go for whatever reason, whether it's legitimate security fears or straight up racism, doesn't matter. Um, you know, oftentimes you couldn't even, you couldn't get a cab even if you called, right? And so uh, the new system, while imperfect as everything is, uh, is infinitely better. You know, when I get up in the morning and I got to get to the airport, I basically, you know, I get ready. I pull up Uber or Lyft. I find where the drivers are. I realize, okay, I need to do this in this amount of time. And I call them. Um, and I, you know, I travel a lot for my job and I can say in that time, only once have I had any sort of issue with, with, uh, actually getting to the airport on time. All the rest of the time, it's easy peasy. And and that did not exist 20 years ago. Like, totally didn't exist. So maybe the way to uh, defend the free market is actually just to remind people how much better their <laughs> lives are. I mean, people do that oh, on the regular. but <laughs> One thousand um, percent. And that, you know. There is, and I don't, I don't really talk about this in the book much, but I have written about it before, is that, you know, one of the hardest parts of defending free market capitalism is that we are, it's, it's a victim of its own prosperity, right? That you have generations of people who really don't rem know or remember what life was like before whatever, right? And, you know, trade and globalization are huge in this regard. Um, you know, cars in the 1980s sucked. You could not, I mean, an American car in the 1980s was like a, a death trap. I mean, in the case of the <laughs> Ford Pinto, literally a death trap. Um, and it was only after decades of Japanese competition and some bankruptcies, and then finally a bailout a uh, government bailout that let the uh, American auto companies ditch some of their idiotic labor contracts and some other things. Um, did American car cars actually start um, performing right now? Yeah. I mean, a Ford is pretty much as good as a Honda. Uh, 40 years ago, that wasn't the case and people totally forget it. Um, we also totally take for granted so many of the new technologies and and other things that are greatly enabled by, by globalization, right? Um, you know, and it's not just about smartphones and apps and the rest. I mean, you can go down the list of, um, of products that if they did exist, they were super expensive back in the day, but most likely they didn't, didn't exist at all. And, you know, a lot of that is, um, we, we just take for granted now. Um, and so certainly I think it's, it's important for free marketers like me to remind you kids about, uh, how much life sucked back in the olden days, because, you know, so much of what drives anti-capitalist stuff is this nostalgia. Life was great for families in the 1970s or the 1950s. Um, you know, there's this meme that keeps circulating about how amazing, uh, life was um, on one income in the 1950s. And it's absolute nonsense if you look at the data and the rest. But that stuff is very powerful. And so it's critical, I think, for, for guys like me to remind the kids that, uh, no, it was not amazing. For the vast majority of people, particularly middle-class folks and, and 
and poorer folks, um, life has has really, for the most of us, never been better. And I mean, okay, so you talk about so many different ways in which life can get even better, mm-hmm. better if we kind of like liberate the worker yeah. from yeah. all of these regulations. And obviously, we're running low on time, and so we can't talk about tariffs and education, but we're going to be talking about housing affordability really fast because I recently realized how expensive yeah. housing is being a college student in Charlottesville. Um, it's very expensive. Yeah. And I'm really invested because I have to pay for it. So um, I don't know. To me, it seems like almost one of the largest barriers that prevents people from moving from one place to another, even if the future place, the other place, has more money, more jobs, more opportunity. So I guess, like, how does housing play into this story? And what do we do about it? Yeah. Well, it, it, it plays into it a couple of ways. Uh, first, like you said, is that high housing prices, whether it's rents or home prices, um, are an invisible wall around uh, uh, places that have high growth and good job pro- possibilities. You know, before the pandemic, people always talked about, you know, San Francisco, New York City and the rest. But even today in places that are now booming, like Atlanta or Nashville or Dallas, um, you know, prices are higher and and they keep going higher. I live in Raleigh and housing prices here are kind of out of control. So if housing prices are high and you're in a place that kind of is struggling and you want to go move to get a better job, have a better life, whatever, um, you can't move if you can't find a place to, to, to live. Um, the other problem is that We've subsidized mortgages. Uh, we, the United States has one of the most um, interventionist mortgage subsidy, mortgage housing policy in the world. And we've, so we, we've kind of pushed mortgages on people that maybe should be renting. And that mortgage creates an anchor, right? If you can't sell your house, you can't move. Or if you're underwater because housing prices have collapsed like they did during the Great Recession, you can't move. So it works in in a couple ways. And then finally, for the people who are lucky enough to move, high home prices are just a massive drag on your overall quality of life. You know, if you're making uh 70 grand a year after taxes and you're paying 4 grand a month in for in a home uh you know for rent or or your house, man, you're in trouble. You know, if you're over 50% of your income for, for housing, you're, you're, you're going to feel pretty poor. Um, and so, and that prevents, you know, all sorts of, uh, not just happiness, but improvement, right? Maybe you can't afford that night class to get certified in something, who knows, right? Or you can't save for your kid's education. You can't, buy stuff that would, of course, employ other people and and so forth and so on. So there's all sorts of ways that housing can kind of eat an economy and hurt workers. But the worst part is, you know, I mentioned the the mortgage involvement, but the fact is that there on the supply side, there are just so many government rules that make housing way more expensive than it should be. Um, We have tariffs on almost everything you need to build a house from the lumber to the countertops and the shelves and the steel nails and the rest, right? Uh, Um. We restrict immigration um, that, you know, creates uh, higher labor costs in a sector that is very much disproportionately um, staffed by by immigrants. Uh, And then, of course, we have all sorts of land use regulations, you know, restrictive zoning and minimum lot sizes and parking requirements and the rest that have repeatedly been shown over and over and over to dramatically increase uh, home prices and not just increase home prices, but make it essentially impossible to build starter homes because if your upfront costs are high because the land is expensive because the land use regulations or the building materials are expensive or the permitting costs are expensive, well, then you you can't build a inexpensive house. You have to build a giant McMansion to get your money back, right, if you're a developer. So you throw it all together and we have just totally mucked up 
our our housing supply, particularly again in high growth areas, and um, that's a, a particularly bad problem for poor and middle class folks. So um, the book goes through a lot of different things that you could do that 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 federal, state, and local policymakers could do to improve the situation. You know, high growth places are always going to have higher housing costs because of the demand. Right, and because it takes a while to build, and the and it's a risky thing to overbuild, but there still is a lot of stuff we could be doing to make things better. And I wish that we had more time to explore more of these areas. But listeners, you're just going to have to read the book. Um, yeah, and I really recommend it too. But I wanted to ask you, kind of, to conclude, um, if you could convince politicians or Americans or whoever. Mm-hmm. One message from your book, the most essential thing, what would it be? Yeah, I think the the essential message is that politicians need to stop trying to pick one worker, one job, one place, one model, and instead focus far more on just simply creating an environment for workers to do what they want to do in the workforce. Um, because, you know, the, I hopefully COVID has finally proven to everybody that the, the trends of today are not the trends of tomorrow. And that is not simply about uh, pandemic stuff or, or cities, though, of course, that matters. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons why things change. Change. Workers' priorities change. The hot cities, whatever, change. And when you try to predict or you try to base policy on what's hot today, or when you try to promise kind of cradle to grave protection for certain types of jobs, inevitably that's going to run into the realities of tomorrow and make things worse, not better for the vast majority of folks. So it is far better for far more people, to look at policy as facilitating uh, personal adjustment and growth that workers want to do anyway, but are stymied by, again, by policy. Um, And that type of open, flexible, dynamic environment, while it's a scarier thing, right? And, you know, yeah, you can't promise X, Y, and Z uh, in terms of subsidies and mandates and the rest, it actually will benefit uh, far more people in a in a much bigger way than, you know, any sort of government chat. And listeners, again, I cannot recommend this book enough to you. It's accessible. It's educational. There are pictures. There are graphs. There are many different contributors. It's great. <laughs> so one last question, now that I'm done hyping you up a little bit. <laughs> What yeah, is right. one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> a policy thing or just a, Anything. Uh, a thing thing? A thing thing. Oh, well, man. Uh, that's, wow. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of something uh, profound. Found, uh, and I kind of—I mean, actually, you know—I kind of already hit on it. Um, I, and, but I'm, I'm going to reiterate it because I, that's an—I think—an easy answer that actually is is pretty important. Um, I think a lot of, particularly these days with social media and um, the rest, um, there is a lot of pressure to uh, to be snarky and dismissive and sarcastic and you name it, right? To be too cool for school, as we used to say, um, and to be kind of a jerk in the process. And I think the the thing I realized uh, now, you know, I was always a pretty happy guy, but I kind of fell into this too, because it's so seductive. Um, but the reality is that, that being a, a genuinely nice and gregarious and person and and following mom's old rule that if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all, um, is a pretty darn good rule to live by. Uh, not only will you be happier, but uh, you'll be you'll be better off professionally too. <laughs>
Once again, I'd like to thank my guest for their time and insight. And I'd like to thank you for listening to The Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you.